Wow. <laughs> Look at this, though. So it's from her perspective. Uh, that's the beer she was sipping and kind of leaks into Denji's mouth. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the shot composition has been really quite noticeable in this one. Look at this. Look at this. Whoa, that's interesting. Whoa. Whoa. Jeez. I love how they're using different angles for the same scene. Let's see how this plays out. Yeah. ケロで汚したあ、<笑><笑> Oh, is that it? Is that it in her mouth? Here, let me help you taste that flavor. Yeah, yeah. There you go. Got yourself an indirect kiss. Oh, I love how everything just faded out in the background there. <laughs><笑> ちょっと。お前もエッチしたかったろ。わあ。初めては牧間さんがいいな。ナイス。オッケー、グッド。銃の悪魔ぶっ殺すまで。電磁君、おはよう。オールライト。ビスシュビ<笑>私に乱暴なことされなかった。ああ、誰が下ろんなと厄介。俺は初めては牧間さんって決めたんだ。ああ、よかったよかった。ああ、いや、いや、as <laughs> マキマさんとくっつける協力するからさ。私とアキ君は付き合う。あいつどこ好きなの?顔。ああ。たまに朝食べに来なよ。マジンちゃんとアキ君を付き合う。ああ、ナイス。マジンちゃん。ふう。
味ひどくないか味のよしよしがわからないんだなまあ仕方ないか Who's this? Who's this? 幼少期に同じような味のもんしか食べてないと大人になってバカ舌になるらしいじいちゃんヤクザだったけど正義のヤクザでさ、oh. Oh. 必要悪っていうのかな女子供も数えるほどしか殺したことないんだと。Only ever killed a handful. Something's making a lot of people. d e n z i お前も好きだったろ。何のつもりだ Yeah, I was gonna say, oh, no, 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 no. 十の悪魔は、てめえの心臓が欲しいんだとよ。Oh, shit! Oh, oh, oh. What? A fiend? Oh shit! Oh, Himeno sent by the Chio Tometo. Whoa! Goddamn sword devil? Oh my god, the movement there! So. Oh, he's using the sword! <laughs> wow. Yeah, there's a lot of guns that showed up all of a sudden, right? No, it's not impossible. Juno その持っている釘を何回か刺したら死ぬみたいな感じかあんたいい動きだったね I think they showed that character in the opening, right? <笑>どうして負けた油断したマジで油断したじゃあさっさと殺して<笑>おお。まだ生きてるぞ。デビルハンターのスーツは頑丈だからな。とどめを刺して。ワイトトーンのシフト。フリーちゃん、あいつの動き、見えんかったもん。ゴースト。嫌だ。あの女。恐ろしい。新人が死んだ時なんかは隠れて泣いていたから面白かったあれだけ思って泣いてもらえたら嬉しいだろうな
Wow. Okay. Okay. Oh my goodness. That is quite the staggering ending. That is just oof, quite the tonal shift, right? Uh, I mean, the stakes have escalated. I mean, it has established the stakes at this point, right? Um, and the things at risk uh, and the things at play, you know, over the span of these seven, eight episodes, uh, you know, this whole concept of, you know, that's just the life of a devil hunter, right? You could lose your life at a moment's notice, uh, you know, but hearing about it is one thing, but seeing it in motion and seeing major characters on the brink of death and essentially dying, right? A few of them have died here. Uh, more on that later, uh, because, you know, before I go any further, I don't think for a second that Makima is gone, gone. You know, it, it just doesn't add up. It, there's just too much uh, that, that hasn't been kind of, you know, explained. I mean, uh, for the most part, they haven't even really begun kind of flushing out the character of Makima. You know, there's so much that's still shrouded in mystery. Um, you know, essentially, it's the perfect time, isn't it? It, it is the perfect setup to finally depict the true nature of Makima, right? This is the perfect setup, isn't it? I mean, there's actually a few perfect setups in this episode, you know, at the end there, there's only one thing left now, right? Someone's got to pull the ripcord, you know, is power around? I didn't, you know, it was kind of going really quick. Uh, and again, you know, that really sets the tone, you know, puts us, the audience, in the shoes of someone like Aki, right? Who is quite panicked. He's making quick, you know, decisions. And one of those decisions includes pulling out the sword Right, using the sword, uh, but it ends up actually being a, a giant nail, uh, and you know, no hesitation, no second thoughts. Uh, that is the nature of the situation. But also, you know, it, to me, it kind of felt like a desperate attempt at trying to kind of, you know, get some equal footing back uh, at a foregone conclusion, something that is inevitable at this point, or something that felt inevitable at this point. You know, he's immediately on the back foot as the Yakuza guy's grandson gets the, the jump on them, right? Uh, you know, you listen, you know, it's that age-old setup, right? The strange man, the strange man that's sitting by himself who starts speaking, right? Who starts talking to you, who starts engaging, right? And there's something off about him. Um, and, you know, you feel that immediately, right? You feel that. Uh, but I kind of I kind of enjoyed that aspect of it, that, you know, something from episode one is now being brought back in. Yes, of course, the, the Yakuza boss, you know, major scumbag. Um, but, you know, it's all about perspective, isn't it? You look at this guy, um, I don't have a name for him, but he also appears to be uh, the same thing Denji is, the same type of hybrid Denji is. Because earlier I thought, okay, maybe he's a fiend, right? But no, as the, the last portion of the episode kind of played out, it became clear, no, 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 this is, you know, this is the same thing as Denji. So, it's really quite unique, quite rare. Uh, and it, the, even, the, even the look, right? Even the look itself is really quite similar to Denji, isn't it? Right? Um, so yeah, you know, as of this point, the only thing that can really happen now is you got to bring the Chainsaw Man in. But yeah, that potential showdown promises to be uh, mental. Mental is the term that comes to mind. And, you know, as it's playing out, as I saw the form, yeah, you know, I realized that I have seen that character, that sword devil, I suppose. Though it's not a, it's not a devil, you know, I should kind of um, take that back. You know, that, that character is in the opening. It's featured in the opening. And also they do show the full form of the ghost, right? The tangible version of the ghost. Uh, though ultimately that's a bit of a flawed uh, state to be in, right? Because uh, it, essentially, that is the complete form of the ghost, right? But I suppose the, the trade-off is that since it's tangible, or sorry, you know, for it to be in that form, it has to be tangible, right? Then, of course, you know, it being tangible, um, the snake devil comes out, you know, just as you thought it's about to calm down, it hits you again, right? It hits you again, man. It's kind of like a bear attack. It's, it, it's nonstop. It's relentless, isn't it? It's brutal. I mean, the second half of that episode is just really quite brutal, isn't it? And it's depiction of... Uh, these attacks, I mean, you know, Makima, uh, especially, uh, Makima and her associate uh, assistant who's kind of accompanying her to Kyoto, um, yeah, you know, their execution is really quite uncensored, isn't it? You know, the initial shots, right? Uh, it's really quite graphic and really quite jarring and realistic, right? It's jarring because it feels realistic, authentic. And then, of course, the camera, uh, you know, it's a tight shot of Makima, uh, like a bloody mess, 
Uh, though, like I mentioned, I don't think, you know, for a second that that's the end of Makima. Listen, she got shot. That's her, her dead body right there from the looks of it, right? Uh, and the, the important thing here is that she was a crucial component of this hit, this organized operation, right? This is not some chance thing, you know, this is um, planned out and carried out uh, this hit, you know, this mass hit on uh, the special unit, right? It appears to be just the special unit. Uh, it targeted all of them. And, you know, I, I, I say it's, I say it's quite planned. It's quite uh, structured and by design because they knew everything. They knew the exact places to hit them. They knew their identities. And I'm speaking of the identities of that specific group, the ones that were so nicely set up in the last episode, right? Um, but it appears most of that principal main cast that was established, it's gone. It's gone. So, you know, given the nature of this execution and this hit, so first thought, you know, it has to be, is this an inside job? Surely it's got to be an inside job, right? All the, all the components uh, are kind of there, right? Uh, and the fact that there's guns, lots and lots of guns, you know, the thing, the thing to notice here is that, you know, Denji, Aki, uh, uh, Himeno, Power, they don't even, they don't even recognize the gunshots. It doesn't even register as gunshots because that's not something that is really common at all. And this is established a few episodes ago, right? Because of the tight gun control, the, the censorship, uh, because of the fear of guns, because they had kind of escalated and reached this peak, uh, this boiling point, this paranoia. So yeah, you know, since then, it's been quite effective, so effective that gunshots going off doesn't even register really. It just registers as something else entirely, right? It doesn't even kind of cross your mind or their mind, right? Um, so they certainly get blindsided. But then, you know, the next question uh, becomes, how the hell do you get that many guns on the street in the hands of so many people? Now, again, I'm not really sure if these are just civilians or if it's a mix of civilians uh, that are clearly kind of brought in um, into this operation. Because, you know, I say civilians because there's that grandma, there's that old lady. They, it, it kind of feels like there are a few civilians in here that are kind of roped into this. Um, though, you know, it should be noted that essentially all of them are off screen. Right, all of these are off screen. Though, listen, given given the fact that it's a definitive death, essentially for Himeno, and you know the the presentation, the beautiful, uh, yeah, yes, tragic, but you know beautifully executed uh, death scene of Himeno. Yeah, you know, it it feels like that's it. That's it for her. But you know, I find I find it really quite interesting that the most clear death, on screen death, uh, you know, being Makima, that's the one that's the least believable at this point. <laughs> Right, the rest are off screen, but you know there's a really good chance that most of them are dead, right? Um, you know, this Kobane, there's Arai, there's the other two, um, the guy who looked like Jean, you know, the guy who had the glasses. Um, yeah, all of them. It, it looks like they all got executed. But kind of going back to the emergence of these guns, right? All of a sudden, you, I think you would have to assume that there is a, there's quite an influence here through the Gun Devil, right? I mean, the Gun Devil is at the at the center of it all. Right, uh, as the guy mentioned, uh, again, no name, right? Uh, the grandson of the Yakuza boss, uh, you know, the gun devil, he wants your heart, right? Pochta, of course, you know, they've been hinting at this. Uh, I mean, it, it was pretty clear by this point that indeed there is some history there, there is some animosity there that kind of uh, dates back who knows how long, right? Um, so yeah, you know, the gun devil is at the center of it all, right? Uh, so you know, to me, it even kind of felt like perhaps there's a chance that the sword devil, uh, I'm just going to call it a sword devil for now. I'm not even sure the term I should be using, but, you know, it appears that maybe it does have uh, access or it does have a bit of the gun flesh, right? Maybe even the girl who appears to be the handler, right? Uh, in a position of uh, authority from the looks of it, from the sounds of it. Um, and it also appears that his powers uh, or, you know, him being this sword uh, hybrid being, it appears to be something new to that guy as well, right? That he recently just kind of acquired this ability, right? So he's still kind of putting it into uh, into motion, kind of testing it out in the field. Um, and she is really quite formidable herself, isn't she? I mean, that snake devil comes in and one bite, one kill, uh, one kills the ghost, right? Uh, and that's, that's the thing I'm speaking of, right? It becomes tangible in that form. So uh, the snake was able to take it out. 
Though, of course, unless that snake was able to still get the ghost, right? Maybe for everything else, it's still intangible, right? Can't be touched, but perhaps the snake devil was able to get the intangible uh, ghost in that form as well. And of course, you know, in terms of it being a potential inside job, they are giving us direct clues to that as well, right? Because Aki questions uh, this emergence of the gun, right? Uh, just one gun, right? He was just baffled by that one gun, right? He doesn't even know how things have played out all over uh, Tokyo, right? Um, so just the one gun had him shook, had him shocked, right? So he puts it out there. Again, it's kind of being put out for the audience as well, right? You can only get those guns uh, or the only people that should have access to those guns are the police or the devil hunters, right? The public safety devil hunters. Uh, so right then and there, you know um, that the guns had to come through that channel. And of course, if these guns didn't come through those official channels, right? Um, be it through some, some sort of deal, some sort of, you know, betrayal, uh, bribes or something, some kind of setup, some kind of agreement. Uh, because you have to remember, you know, they, they kind of set up this unit, the special unit as expendable as well, right? So maybe for the right amount of money or for the right deal, for the right agreement, you know, this was kind of put into motion and the guns are kind of allocated uh, and kind of presented or provided. But if it's not that, then you have to look towards the gun devil, right? Uh, there's a good chance that it could have been provided by the gun devil itself, right? The entity that is the gun devil. But, you know, isn't it crazy that these characters like Himeno and Aki are putting these definitive choices into motion, you know, be it Aki pulling that sword, right? And who knows how many years he's got left now, how many years he sliced off using that sword, that nail, right? And I love the, the depiction of it or the use of it, right? And if I have this right, it looks like um, Aki kind of pinpoints uh, and kind of sets up the sword or the nail targeting the exact area that needs to be stabbed. And then it, there's like this flicking motion through the curse devil, right? So uh, I thought that was really quite unique and interesting the approach to that. But then it appears that it needed three strikes. Then it was able to initiate the, the kill blow, right? The final the final blow, essentially. Again, the crucifixion from the looks of it. And then, of course, you know, Aki must think, uh, okay, that's that. You know, that got hairy. That got really hairy. But no, this, this girl shows up, right? Um, who seems to have a lot of knowledge about different curses, or sorry, not curses, of different contracts and devils. Uh, because she knew that's the cursed devil. Now, I'm not 100% sure if, you know, uh, the sword hybrid man coming back to life is just a similar case to Denji or if she actually did something to resurrect him, right? Because she kind of reaches for him and touches him and then it kind of cuts to Aki. Uh, and then the next frame is of the sword hybrid man kind of standing up again. Um, but since, you know, he, he seems to be um, the same type of thing as Denji, Perhaps it's the same type of build, same type of setup. But once again, there's that funny moment of these devils, or in this case, this hybrid swordman, um, thinking it was creepy. I believe he said, you know, you know, what's this creepy shit, <laughs> right? As he was being targeted by uh, the collaboration, right? Between uh, the cursed devil and Aki, right? As he's striking one by one, counting down. Um, now, let me kind of shift the focus to him and Owen. Right, that you know, that is not some sort of uh, cool or triumphant uh, moment. You know, it's really quite tragic. It's all really quite tragic. The final moment on the rooftop there, or not? It's not even the rooftop. It's just a building, right? That gets crushed by the the fox devil at first because he calls upon the fox devil services. Um, I, I suppose everyone else in that building, in that kitchen, they're dead, right? Uh, but yeah, I don't know. Is the fox devil gone? Gone? It gets sliced up. Um, it wasn't able to kind of um, handle this being, right? It's certainly something different as it, as it stated. So yeah, let's see how that plays out because the Fox Devil does have deals with other devils, including Arai. Um, but yeah, you know, it looked like it looked like it got chopped up. It looked like it was a kill blow, a killing shot, right? If it just comes back the same and nothing changed, then it's not really quite, um, there's not much to it then, right? Uh, it's all superfluous in that sense. But the moment Himeno kind of gets a chance to assess the situation, you know, her own situation, and, you know, it looked like it was really bad. And she realizes this, right? She got shot in the heart. Uh, she's probably got moments to live, as Power mentioned. Yeah, she'll probably need a doctor, right? I've done all I could, but she'll need a doctor. Um, yeah, you know, she made the choice then and there. She saw Aki 
right? And there's no chance she's she's going to let Aki die, right? Uh, so she did everything. She gave up her life essentially, right? At a moment's notice. Uh, don't die on me, Aki. Uh, don't die on me so you can cry for me. Um, those are haunting moments. Those are those are the types of things that really haunt you, right? Those final moments. Uh, essentially, she's going to become a ghost for Aki, right? As she does kind of disappear limb by limb. It really is quite impactful, isn't it? It had the gravitas, it had the heft, right? Um, that yeah, this is this is a this is a major death coming in, right? There's no fake outs here. There's none of that. Um, yeah, uh, and you know I've got to say, Oshio's score in that moment, it's 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 perfection. And I think the voice acting for Himeno in that scene is so crucial. It really is so crucial. Uh, actually, throughout the episode, from the beginning to the end. Right? Uh, the range in that voice acting, um, really quite impressive, I thought. Uh, now, you know, that's a major death. That's a major death for sure. Again, you know, Maki, my major character, yes, she got shot point blank and then she got pumped full of lead for good measure. And then, right, I should, pro yeah, I should probably go back and finish my initial point on that. And then they're like, okay, good to go, good to go, right? Team C uh, can confirm, right? It was a confirmation to the other teams that, okay, this problem, the big problem, essentially, that should tell you something as well, right? Um, that is a telling moment that they had to make sure to take on Makima first because if they don't take her out, the other shit's not going to happen or you're not going to be able to execute the rest of the operation. And also, as I'm on the topic of the train execution, how about the sound design? You know, first of all, I love the 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 absence of a score, a background score, right? It's just the the ambient noises of the train the inside of the train carriage um, and the whooshing of the train. Uh, and then, right, uh, I mean, there's some beautiful shots in this. I mean, it's essentially one of the best looking episodes. <laughs> That's saying something, right? It's saying something. Eight episodes in, this might just be the best looking episode. I mean, it might just be the best episode uh, altogether, right? There's a strong case for that. But there's some beautiful, stunning imagery inside the train as well. But then, you know, the sound design kicks in. Um, uh, I mean, first of all, you know, a visual cue in terms of something being off. Four of them, they just kind of go down. You know, they kind of lean down and then you hear the bags opening up, the zipper of the bags. And the fact that it's more than one of them opening up, right, because it's shown us that it's four of them, you start thinking of that possibility immediately, right? I'm sure many of you thought the same thing, right? That's essentially the design of this, right? The zipper opening up, the first thing you think of, oh God, they're about to pull something out here. You know, something's about to go down here. So I thought that was so effective. You know, it's it's something they've been really quite effective at. Um, the sound design and the ambient noises um, playing a big part. You know, once Makima is taken out and they get confirmation or they're able to give confirmation, uh, then, you know, a scene quite reminiscent of something like The Godfather or something out of a Scorsese gangster flick, right? The execution. I mean, of course, in The Godfather, it's the intercuts of the baptism, right? Um, and the execution of the mob bosses. But in terms of references and inspiration uh, from film, you know, the cinematic approach to this just continues to really uh, impress, really impress. And, you know, I'm here for that. You know, I've been seeing that for some time now, but yeah, I'm loving the presentation and the look of this, you know, the shot composition in this one, right? The camera movements in this episode. Um, it's really all just fantastic stuff, isn't it? Listen, you know, the best scene of the entire anime, oh, sorry, not entire anime, maybe, maybe, but certainly for this episode, I think one, you know, even though the second half is this bombastic tonal shift, a turning point, a significant turning point, I think once again, that slice of life-esque opening, right? Uh, the drunk uh, Himeno coming back to her apartment, right? Bringing Denji along. I mean, you know, this episode is full of incredible storyboarding and animation, right? Uh, you know, some stunning imagery for sure. And, you know, of course, in terms of animation, the fight, uh, Aki against the sword, hybrid man. Um, you know, I'm still kind of drawn to a lot of this stuff in the first half. Uh, and then the wide angle perspective used or utilized in a lot of that, uh, you know, flashback uh, in a lot of those moments of Himeno. That's also another thing though, right? This is the second time uh, they're showing us this scene, but I thought it was so effective. Right, the presentation, the framing of it, 
it, it felt like a different scene altogether from her perspective. Now, I'm not saying that, you know, from this perspective, from a different perspective, um, it's a totally different story. No, no, no. It's still a dicey situation as, you know, as she's, she is quite relieved uh, the morning after, right? But I thought it was a good choice to have that scene a second time from a different perspective and putting the audience into that situation once again, once again, right? Into that really uneasy situation. Um, and, you know, of course, some of the POV shots, really quite immersive. But like I discussed in the last episode, you know, this is a person who has flaws and desires and who is hurt by jealousy as well, right? That is kind of driving some of her thinking at that point in time. Um, so yeah, you know, uh, I don't want to, you know, start going back into that again, but yeah, I thought it was, it was a good conclusion to that moment, right? It was, it was quite a dicey and hairy situation and she's happy that nothing, nothing goes down. And how about Denji? You know, this is growth. This is growth. He made the choice. He made the choice, right? He declined. Um, so yeah, you know, love to see that, of course. Uh, of course, you know, he wants his first time to be with Makima, but, you know, him being in a position to actually take that step, right? Being able to decline something like that, right? Right? But yeah, before I forget, uh, let me kind of go back to uh, the cinematic approach to this. You know, some of the earlier uh, uses of the wide angle, super wide angle, right? Uh, to the point that you see distortion. It's really quite reminiscent of uh, Chris Doyle's photography on Fallen Angels, right? Uh, you think of Chivo, Emmanuel Lubezki, um, and his photography on Birdman, The Revenant. So yeah, you know, this is really quite up my alley. It really is. Um, the cinematic approach to it all, the cinematic language of this anime. Uh, and that was clear since day one. And of course, the morning after has some stunning imagery itself, right? It's a visual spectacle, isn't it? From top to bottom, from beginning to end. Um, it's, it's a jaw dropper of an episode. That whole thing about the alliance and you know becoming friends, yeah, it was starting to sound a bit too good to be true, a little too wholesome, right? So in that sense, yeah, death flag, right? And of course, you know, the death flags for Aki continue as well, don't they? Especially since he's kind of you know uh, sliced um, a substantial portion of his life uh, by the end of this episode. And you know, I was making this point earlier: these actions, th these actions are not enough. They ended up being kind of futile. Yes, you know, Himeno giving her life up, sacrificing herself, giving everything so he could stay alive. Yes, you know, it kind of delayed it. Uh, perhaps delayed it enough that maybe Denji uh, can be brought into this situation, right? As long as someone pulls his ripcord. Um, and, you know, that's another thing. He got shot in the head, but us as the audience, don't even give it a second thought, right? He's not dead. <laughs> he got shot right in the dome but all of us know he's not dead right because they, it's been set up already he'll be fine you could kind of kind of apply the same logic to someone like makima right who i believe to be some sort of powerful entity herself but so yeah you know i'm sure a lot of us or majority of us are not convinced at all that makima has died here but quickly as i am mentioning makima and himeno and you know denji and aki and all of them I love how, you know, she'll usually get minimal screen time, yet she's this looming presence, this large looming presence above these characters. And she has this emotional control over these characters and she doesn't even need to be um, on screen, right? Uh, so yeah, but you know, a thing I found really interesting is her kind of reminiscing about the night before, the drinks. It, it appears that she actually enjoyed that, right? Um, enough to mention it, right? She was kind of dreading this meeting um, you know, she said, oh, they're kind of intimidating, but you know, I was kind of like, are they really that intimidating for you? Right. <laughs> uh, but yeah, you know, I thought it was interesting that she was mentioning the drinks last night, you know, maybe a bit of that mingling and, uh, I don't know, um, getting to know some of these people, uh, or, you know, kind of having a good time. Maybe it did something for her as well. Right. She's been presented as this hollow figure, right. The stoic, um, figure this whole time. Um, who, like, once again, at the right moment, comes in and after this uh, disappointing encounter, a sexual encounter for Denji, she's able to kind of help him uh, forget about it. And lastly, let me just kind of touch up on a few more points. Something like uh, the Yakuza boss and, you know, the grandson uh, and, you know, the connection, 
that strange connection that they have, uh, Denji and the and the guy, the sword hybrid guy. God damn, I, I hope I get a name that I can use for this person, right? Um, because he's not a devil, he's not a human, he's just that hybrid like Denji, right? So again, it's meant to be a really unique case, but there are other cases of it, right? And here's one of them right, right now on screen. It's all a matter of perspective, isn't it? You know, this grandpa of his, this Yakuza boss, you know, he used and abused and exploited Denji um, for that financial gain. And then of course, this unknown grandson is one of the, the people that benefited from uh, the exploitation of Denji. And then of course, ultimately they had to cut the middleman out, right? They wanted to make a deal themselves and they did, or he did, the Yakuza boss, you know, the, the, the zombie king, right? They wanted their own thing. But now I'm not sure if this guy is actually um, an active member of the Yakuza at the moment, the grandson. Uh, but he made the deal. He made the deal, that's for sure. Um, or he was given uh, the prospect of a deal and he took it, right? Um, I, I feel like he probably has a bit of the gun flesh on him. Uh, you know, power. Uh, yeah, you don't see power rattled like that, right? And she told him, you know, listen, man, I can't even follow the movements, right? Once, you know, once the sword guy, the hybrid guy kind of settled down and learned his lesson, right? It was kind of like curtains. It was, right? It was like Aki was instantly outmatched, right? It, it was like a different realm. But also lastly, you know, this, this notion of Aki crying in private this whole time for the rookies he's lost, right? It was really quite touching, right? You know, it, it was clear to me really early on. Remember I mentioned, you know, it appears to be this really cool character that has a hard exterior and it's nothing new. You know, all of us have seen these types of characters, but also, someone who has a big heart right? inside it's soft they're quite a soft person quite a caring person right and lastly if you do go back to episode two and that harsh beatdown of denji right in the back alley he was trying you know he's trying to beat some sense into him right yeah it, it really was quite harsh at the moment but now you know once you you have a lot of context uh, about aki and you get to learn about aki and the type of person he is it was a harsh approach but he did not want another rookie another you know, another individual coming into this and dying, you know, kind of giving up their life just like that, right? So he was actually trying to protect Tenji by giving, you know, or dishing out that beatdown. But yeah, I think that does it for this episode. I mean, there's the ending. Uh, you know, I didn't quite get a chance to take a deep dive into the ending. Maybe I'll, I'll check that out off screen and maybe if I find something. I mean, I thought I saw a few really interesting things um, in terms of uh, the progression of some of these frames and the next thing... Uh, being shown but you know that reminds me a few episodes ago in the ending there was a shot of a ghost hand and a cigarette right uh, kind of grabbing a cigarette and stealing the cigarette and kind of disappearing um yeah i mean in hindsight could that have been a depiction of himeno maybe even yeah but yeah you know it was really focused on himeno and aki that ending uh beautiful i mean it's a stunning ending I mean, it does have a few of the other characters, but it prominently features the relationship of uh, Aki and Himeno, right? Uh, and then it also kind of felt like a goodbye to Himeno as well. But yeah, I think that's about it for this one, folks. If you enjoyed that, consider dropping a like. The likes really do help the channel. Uh, they help this content get noticed by other fans of Chainsaw Man or anime in general. So if you enjoyed it, really do consider dropping a like. It takes a split second. Drop some comments. Give me your thoughts. You know, sometimes I might be a few episodes behind, but I always make it to the comments. I always check them out. So, you know, drop your comments. Give me your thoughts. Also, if you're interested in full length or full opacity, and also those include the reactions to the endings, consider checking out the Patreon page, the links in the description and the pinned comment. Also links to social media, if that's your thing. But yeah, that's about it for this one, folks. Thank you for joining me and thank you for your time as time is precious. And I do hope to see you again soon for the next one. Until then, take it easy.